The God's Peculiar People podcast presents a recording of the book, The Life of Dwight L. Moody, by his son, William R. Moody. The Life of D.L. Moody, Chapter 14, Influence of Henry Morehouse. A new epoch in Mr. Moody's religious experience and preaching was marked by his friendship with Henry Morehouse. The acquaintance made in Dublin during his first short visit to Great Britain seems to have been but casual. I have read in the papers about the boy preacher, said Mr. Moody, in relating the circumstances of his meeting with Morehouse, but I did not know that was he. He introduced himself to me and said he would like to come to Chicago to preach. He was a beardless boy, and he didn't look more than seventeen. And I said to myself, he can't preach. He wanted me to let him know what boat I was going to America on, as he would like to go on the boat with me. Well, I thought he couldn't preach, and I didn't let him know. I hadn't been in Chicago a great many weeks before I got a letter saying that he had arrived in America, and that he would come to Chicago and preach for me if I wanted him. Well, I sat down and wrote a very cold letter. If you come west, call on me. I thought that would be the last I should hear of him. I soon got another letter saying he was still in the country, and would come to Chicago and preach for me if I wanted him. I wrote again. If you happen to come west, drop in on me. In the course of a few weeks, I got a letter stating that on a certain Thursday he would be in Chicago and would preach for me. Then what to do with him I didn't know. I had made up my mind that he couldn't preach. I was going to be out of town Thursday and Friday, and I told some of the officers of the church, There is an Englishman coming here Thursday who wants to preach. I don't know whether he can or not. They said there was a great deal of interest in the church, and they did not think he had better preach then. He was a stranger, and he might do more harm than good. Well, I said, you might try him. I will announce him to speak Thursday night. Your regular weekly meeting is on Friday. After hearing him, you can either announce that he will speak again the next night, or you can have your usual prayer meeting. If he speaks well both nights, you will know whether to announce him or me for the Sunday meeting. I'll be back Saturday. When I got back Saturday morning, I was anxious to know how he got on. The first thing I said to my wife when I got in the house was, How is the young Englishman coming along? How do the people like him? They like him very much. Did you hear him? Yes. Well, did you like him? Yes, I liked him very much. He has preached two sermons from that verse of John. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I think you will like him, though he preaches a little differently from you. How is that? Well, he tells the worst sinners that God loves him. Then, said I, he is wrong. I think you will agree with him when you hear him, she said because he backs up everything he says with the Bible. Sunday came, and as I went to the church, I noticed that everyone brought his Bible. The morning address was to Christians. I have never heard anything quite like it. He gave chapter and verse to prove every statement he made. When night came, the church was packed. Now, beloved friends, says the preacher, if you will turn to the third chapter of John and the sixteenth verse, you will find my text. He preached the most extraordinary sermon from that verse. He did not divide the text into secondly and thirdly and fourthly. He just took the whole verse, and then went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to prove that in all ages God loved the world. God had sent prophets and patriarchs and holy men to warn us, and then he sent his son, and after they killed him, he sent the Holy Ghost. I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to thaw out. I could not keep back the tears. It was like news from a far country. I just drank it in. So did the crowded congregation. I tell you, there is one thing that draws above everything else in this world, and that is love. A man that has no one to love him, no mother, no wife, no children, no brother, no sister, belongs to a class that commits suicide. It's pretty hard to get a crowd out in Chicago on a Monday night, but the people came. They brought their Bibles, and Morehouse began. Beloved friends, if you will turn to the third chapter of John and the sixteenth verse, you will find my text. And again he showed on another line, from Genesis to Revelation, that God loves us. He could turn to almost any part of the Bible and prove it. Well, I thought that was better than the other one. He struck a higher note than ever, and it was sweet to my soul to hear it. He just beat that truth down to my heart, and I have never doubted it since. I used to preach that God was behind the sinner with a double-edged sword trying to hew him down, and I have got done with that. I preach now that God is behind him with love, and he is running away from the God of love. Tuesday night came, and we thought he had surely exhausted the text and that he would like another. But he said, If you will, turn to the third chapter of John, and the sixteenth verse, you will find my text. And he preached again from that wonderful text. 
and the sight he seemed to strike a higher chord still. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, not going to have when you die, but have it right now, but have it right here, now, eternal life. By that time we began to believe it, we have never doubted it since. For six nights he preached on that one text. The seventh night came, and he went into the pulpit. Every eye was upon him, and he said, Beloved friends, I have been hunting all day for a new text, but I cannot find anything so good as the old one. So we will go back to the third chapter of John, and the sixteenth verse. And he preached the seventh sermon from those wonderful words, God so loved the world. I remember the end of the sermon. My friends, he said, For a whole week I have been trying to tell you how much God loves you, but I cannot do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder and climb up into heaven and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, to tell me how much love the Father has for the world, all he could say would be, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If a man gets up in that pulpit and gives out that text today, there is a smile all over the church. Mr. Morehouse taught Moody to draw his sword full length, to fling the scabbard away, and entered the battle with a naked blade. The first visit to America was repeated in August 1868, when he again visited Chicago and labored with Mr. Moody for two months, preaching in his church and in Farwell Hall. During this time, accompanied by Mr. Moody, he went to various other cities, holding some 72 meetings. In the winter of 1872, he came again to America and conducted services in Chicago, and again in 1878, he assisted Mr. Moody's evangelistic work in a New England mission. Mr. Morehouse was among the first to welcome Moody to England in June 1875, and assisted him at Newcastle on Tyne and other places, taking a leading part in his all-day meetings. The delighted recognition of each other's strength of character bound them closely together in a strong friendship. Mr. Morehouse's affectionate nature and devotion to the Master, and Mr. Moody's strong common sense and ever-widening influence, combined to make them irresistible companions in evangelistic work. The Life of D.L. Moody, Chapter 15 The Chicago Fire and Its Results In the spring of 1871, in company with Philip Phillips and the Rev. J. H. Vincent, Mr. Moody went on a trip to California. On his return to Chicago, the weather had become very hot. His audience was scattered, and it seemed almost impossible to get them together again. For some time, he considered the means of getting hold of them again. At one point he thought he would get some kind of sacred concert, or secure someone to lecture on historical events, for he feared that the gospel would not draw in such weather. After praying over it, the thought came to him, preach to them upon Bible characters. He had some six or eight of these in his mind, and decided to begin with Adam, so he took up Adam and studied the subject, but feared that he could never talk about him for thirty minutes. Then he thought that he would try Enoch. Next he studied Noah, and then came to Abraham, whom he selected as one of the characters. It was not long before Farwell Hall began to fill up, and instead of five weeks he had large congregations. When he came to the study of Christ, he intended to devote six nights to his life. He had been spending four Sunday nights on the subject, and had traced his career from the manger to his arrest and trial. On the fifth Sunday night, October 8th, he preached to the largest congregation that he had ever addressed in that city, having taken for his text, What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? After preaching, or talking, as he did not call it preaching then, with his power of entreaty, presenting Christ as Savior and Redeemer, he said, I wish you would take this text home with you, and turn it over in your minds during the week, and next Sabbath we will come to Calvary and the cross, and we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. What a mistake, he said, in relating the story to a large audience in Chicago on the 22nd anniversary of the great fire in that city in 1871. I have never dared to give an audience a week to think of their salvation since. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I remember Mr. Sankey singing, and how his voice rang when he came to that pleading verse, Today the Savior calls, for refuge fly, the storm of justice falls, and death is nigh. I have never seen that congregation since. I have hard work to keep back the tears today. I have looked over this audience, and not a single one is here that I preached to that night. I have a great many friends, and am well acquainted in Chicago, but twenty-two years have passed away and I have not seen that congregation since, and I never will meet those people again until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you of one lesson I learned that night, which I have never forgotten, and that is when I preach to press Christ upon the people then and there, and try to bring them to a decision on that spot. 
I would rather have that right hand cut off than to give an audience now a week to decide what to do with Jesus. I have often been criticized. People have said, Moody, you seem to be trying to get people to decide all at once. Why do you not give them time to consider? I have asked God many times to forgive me for telling people that night to take a week to think it over. And if he spares my life, I will never do it again. This audience will break up in a few minutes. We may never meet after today. There is something terribly solemn about a congregation like this. You will notice that Pilate was just in the condition of my audience that night. Just the condition that you are in today. He had to decide then and there what to do with Jesus. The thing was sprung upon him suddenly. Although I do not think that Jesus Christ could have been a stranger to Pilate, I do not believe that he had preached in Judea for months and also in Jerusalem without Pilate's having heard of his teachings. He must have heard of the sermons he had preached. He must have heard of the doctrine he taught. He must have heard of the wonderful parables that he uttered. He must have heard of the wonderful miracles that he performed. He must have heard how Herod had taken the life of his forerunner by having him beheaded, and of the cruel way Herod had treated him. Pilate was no stranger to Jesus of Nazareth. Ever since that night of the great fire I have determined as long as God spares my life to make more of Christ than in the past. I thank God that he is a thousand times more to me today than he was twenty-two years ago. I am not what I wish I was, but I am a good deal better than I was when Chicago was on fire. The year 1871 was a critical one in Mr. Moody's career. He realized more and more how little he was fitted by personal acquirements for his work. An intense hunger and thirst for spiritual power was aroused in him by two women who used to attend the meetings and sat in the front row. He could see by the expression on their faces that they were praying. At the close of services, they would say to him, We have been praying for you. Why don't you pray for the people, Mr. Moody would ask? Because you need the power of the Spirit, they would say. I need the power. Why, said Mr. Moody, in relating the incident years ago, I thought I had power. I had the largest congregation in Chicago, and there were many conversions. I was in a sense satisfied. But right along, those two godly women kept praying for me, and their earnest talk about anointing for special service set me to thinking. I asked them to come and talk with me, and they poured out their hearts in prayer that I might receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. There came a great hunger into my soul. I did not know what it was. I began to cry out, as I never did before. I really felt that I did not want to live if I could not have the power for service. While Mr. Moody was in this mental and spiritual condition, Chicago was laid in ashes. The great fire swept out of existence both Farwell Hall and the Illinois Street Church. Sunday night after the meeting, as Mr. Moody went homeward, he saw the glare of flames and knew it meant ruin to Chicago. About one o'clock, Farwell Hall was burned, and soon his church went down. Everything was scattered. At midnight the fierceness of this fire seemed to be waning, and it was thought that the fire department could gain the upper hand, as they had done the night before. The family retired, but within an hour a loud call was made out to all the residents of their street to hasten their escape. The fire had crossed the river and was rapidly advancing. It was too late to think of saving much more than could be carried in the hands. A neighbor took Mr. Moody's two children in his already crowded carriage and made his escape north. A few articles of silver and some valuable tokens of friendship were hastily placed in a baby cart. But there was one article Mrs. Moody's heart was set upon saving. This was a portrait in oil of Mr. Moody by the artist Haley, which hung on the wall and of their parlor. It was a gift from the artist, presented to Mrs. Moody after the return from the first trip to Europe in 1867. A free lease of this house, completely furnished, was presented to Mr. Moody at that time by his Chicago friends, and this portrait Mrs. Moody prized above everything the house contained. A stranger who had entered the room and assisted in taking it from the wall. Calling Mr. Moody, his wife urged him to save it for her. The ludicrous side of the situation at once appealed to him, notwithstanding the terror of that awful night. "'Take my own picture,' he said. "'Well, that would be amusing. Suppose I am made in the street by friends in the same plight as ourselves, and they say, "'Hello, Moody. Glad you have escaped. But what's that you have saved, and cling to so affectionately? Wouldn't it sound well to reply, "'Oh, I've got my own portrait.' No entreaty could prevail on Mr. Moody, but the canvas was hastily knocked out of the heavy frame and carried off by Mrs. Moody herself, the one relic rescued from their home. A bruised face was part of the price paid for the effort, but once on the street there was a constant struggle with the terrific wind. Love won, but only after a fierce battle. This portrait now hangs on the walls of the Northfield home, a reminder of that night a fiery ordeal. As soon as his wife and family were safe with friends, Mr. Moody devoted himself to relief work. Before long, he started for the East to raise money for the homeless, and also for the new church. 
George H. Stewart, and John Wanamaker of Philadelphia, and other friends in the East raised $3,000 in a temporary building, 75 by 100 feet, was immediately reared on a lot not far from the site of the former church. On December 24, 1871, just two months and 15 days after the fire, this building, known as the Northside Tabernacle, was dedicated. When in New York, he heard there was a rich man in Fall River. He was very liberal, so he went to him and secured a check for a large amount. His new friend, who was Mr. R. K. Remington, took him in his carriage to the houses of other rich men in the city. When they parted the train, Mr. Moody grasped his hand and said, If you ever come to Chicago, call on me, and I will try to return your kindness. Said Mr. Remington, Don't wait for me. Do it to the first man that comes along. During this eastern visit, the hunger for more spiritual power is still upon Mr. Moody. My heart was not in the work for begging, he said. I could not appeal. I was crying all the time that God would fill me with his spirit. Well, one day, in the city of New York, oh, what a day, I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it, as it is almost too sacred an experience to name. Paul had an experience of which he never spoke for fourteen years. I can only say that God revealed himself to me, and I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths, and yet hundreds were converted. I would not now be placed back where I was after that blessed experience, if you should give me all the world. It would be as a small dust of the balance. When Mr. Moody returned to Chicago, his mission work at the new tabernacle went forward successfully, and within a year steps were taken to erect a permanent building. The lot on which the present church stands was secured. Contribution came in from all quarters. Thousands of Sunday school students, contributing five cents each, to place a stone in the new edifice. For two years, the basement of the present building was roofed over temporarily and used for meetings. And finally, as a subsequent chapter will explain, means were provided for the completion of the structure, which has since been known as the Chicago Avenue Church. Five years after the Great Fire, when he had returned from his work abroad, Mr. Moody wrote the following letter to the members of the Chicago Avenue Church, whom he loved so dearly. I need not tell you how much I would like to be with you on fast day, but God has ordered it otherwise. And I am alone today with none but my blessed master, waiting in this hotel for the Sabbath to pass, so that I can get on my way to my home, where I can see and try to help cheer my heartbroken mother. He had just received word of the sudden death of a brother. I feel I must tell you some of the thoughts that have been pushed through my mind. For fifteen years I have been especially burdened for three objects. The church... The young Men's Christian Association, and a dear brother who is now in heaven. God has answered my prayer for him, saved him, made him useful to others, and now taken him to himself. That burden is gone. The Young Men's Christian Association has been blessed of late, too. But how is it with my first love? For years I seldom got on my knees in private, but I think and pray for the dear church in Chicago, and of late you have been on my mind and heart far more than usual. Are you going to let this time of blessing pass without a blessing to you? The only way any church can get a blessing is to lay aside all difference, all criticism, all coldness and party feeling, and come to the Lord as one man. And when the church lives in the power of the thirteenth chapter of First Corinthians, I am sure that many will be added daily to the flock of God. I would like to have the church read that chapter together on their knees on Thursday, and as you do so, pray God to apply it with power. Of late my earnest prayer to God has been that He would help me to save more, and I cannot tell you how wonderfully He has answered my prayer. It seems as if you were all much nearer and dearer to me than ever. My heart goes out to you, and I long to see you all coming constantly to God for a fresh supply of love. I found a verse in First Peter 4, 8 today. I never saw it before. Above all things, put on love. Think much of that one expression. Put it at the head of the list. Faith is good, but this is above it. Truth is good, but it is a beautiful sight to see the Church of God study the Word. But what are we if we do not have love? May the dear church get such a flood of love from on high that will fill all our hearts. The last night Jesus was on earth, before they crucified him, he said to his disciples, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Let us think on these solemn words, and may the love of Christ draw us all together, so we will be as one man. Enclosed in this church letter, Mr. Moody wrote the pastor, the Reverend Dr. W. J. Erdman. I do hope you will hold the people to the thought of love. I am sure that is where the churches have all gone astray. We must have it above all things. See how Peter and Paul agree in this. Let us put that first. If the church is sound in love, I think it will be sound in everything else. That God may be with you and bless you in a wonderful manner is my earnest and constant prayer. 
The Life of D.L. Moody, Chapter 16 First Extended Mission in Great Britain So great was the interest at the tabernacle that the work went on unabated during Mr. Moody's absence while working in behalf of the new building. Finding, therefore, that he could be spared from Chicago and desiring to learn more of the Bible from English Bible students, Mr. Moody determined to cross the sea again. He started for a short trip in June 1872. This visit calls for special consideration on account of one incident that undoubtedly marked another important turning point in Mr. Moody's career. He was determined not to get into work, if he could help it. But one day, at the close of the service at the Old Bailey prayer meeting, the Reverend Mr. Lessey, pastor of a church in the north of London, asked him to preach for him the next Sabbath. Mr. Moody consented. The morning service seemed very dead and cold. The people did not show much interest, and he felt that it had been a morning lost. But at the next service, which was at half past six in the evening, it seemed, while he was preaching, as if the very atmosphere was charged with the Spirit of God. There came a hush upon all the people, and a quick response to his words, though he had not been much in prayer that day, and could not understand it. When he had finished preaching, he asked all who would like to become Christians to rise, that he might pray for them. People rose all over the house, until it seemed as if the whole audience was getting up. Mr. Moody said to himself, These people don't understand me. They don't know what I mean when I ask them to rise. He had never seen such results before, and did not know what to make of it. So he put the test again. Now, he said, All of you who want to become Christians, just step into the inquiry room. They went in, and crowded the room so that they had to take in extra chairs to seat them all. The minister was surprised, and so was Mr. Moody. Neither had expected such a blessing. They had not realized that God can save by hundreds and thousands, as well as by ones and twos. When Mr. Moody again asked those that really wanted to become Christians to rise, the whole audience got up. He did not even then know what to do, so he told all who were really in earnest to meet the pastor there the next night. The next day he went over to Dublin, but on Tuesday morning received a dispatch urging him to return, saying that there were more inquirers on Monday than on Sunday. He went back and held meetings for ten days, and four hundred were taken into that church. After some time that was perhaps the secret of this marvelous manifestation of the Spirit's working was revealed, there were two sisters belonging to that church. One was strong, the other was bedridden. One day, as the sick woman was bemoaning her condition, the thought came to her that she could at least pray, and she began to pray God to revive her church. Day and night her prayer went up to God. One day, she read in a paper an account of some meetings Mr. Moody held in America, and though she did not know him, she began to pray that God would send him to her church. On the Sunday Mr. Moody preached, her sister came home and said, Whom do you think preached this morning? She suggested the names of several with whom her pastor was in the habit of exchanging. Finally, her sister told her, It was Mr. Moody from America. I know what that means, cried the sick woman. God has heard my prayers. Mr. Moody believed that it was this revival that carried him back to England the next year. Among other meetings, he attended the Mild May Conference, and thus recorded his impressions of the Reverend William Pinfather, the founder of Mild May. I well remember sitting in the yonder seat, looking up at this platform, and seeing the beloved Mr. Pinfather's face illuminated, as it were, heaven's light. I don't think I can recall a word that he said, but the whole atmosphere of the man breathed holiness, and I got then a lift and an impetus in the Christian life that I have never lost and I believe the impression will remain with me to my dying day. I thank God that I saw and spoke with that holy man. No one could see him without the consciousness that he lived in the presence of God. It was the first and last time they ever met, but Mr. Pinfather was strongly impressed with the conviction that Mr. Moody was one for whom God had prepared a great work, and after his return to America he wrote him, telling him of the wide door open for evangelistic work in London and elsewhere, and promising him a warm welcome if he would ever come over and help them. Other invitations, equally cordial, were received about the same time from Cuthbert Bainbridge of Newcastle-on-Tyne and Henry Bellet of Dublin. These were accompanied with the promise of funds to meet the traveling expenses of Mr. Moody and his party. After arranging for the work in which he had been engaged in Chicago, it was decided to accept these invitations and return to England for a short visit. Philip Phillips, a warm personal friend of Mr. Moody, was at this time the leading gospel singer in America, and Mr. Moody at once urged him to accompany him. This he was not able to do, 
and P.P. Bliss, whose reputation as a gospel solo singer and composer had created a demand for his services on Lost Sides, was then invited. He had been associated with Mr. Moody on several occasions, and both men were closely attached to each other, but in this he was also disappointed, as it seemed impossible for Mr. Bliss to leave home. It was Mr. Moody's first idea to leave Mr. Sankey in Chicago to continue the work in the Mission Church and in the Association. Finally, however, he decided that the British call was of significant importance to take Mr. Sankey from his work for a few months at least. Mr. Moody had at that time about $450, which he had loaned to a friend to be invested during his absence, as all his expenses on the mission were to be met by those who had invited him. Steamship passage for Mr. Moody and his family and Mr. Sankey had been engaged, but the promised funds delayed to come. Within a day or two of the time of departure, Mr. Moody had to prepare the return of his loan to meet travel expenses. On reaching Liverpool on June 17, 1873, the cause for the non-receipt of the promised funds was at once apparent. All three of the cordial and devoted friends on whose invitation Mr. Moody had depended for moral and financial support had been called to be with their Lord. After reading the letter announcing the death of these friends, Mr. Moody turned to Mr. Sankey and said, God seems to have closed the doors. We will not open any ourselves. If he opens the door, we will go in. Otherwise, we will return to America. On their arrival at Liverpool, they went to a hotel, where they spent the evening. Mr. Moody then discovered in one of his pockets an unopened letter which he had received, just before leaving New York, from Mr. Bennett, the secretary of the Young Men's Christian Association at York, England. Mr. Bennett said that he had heard of his work in America among young men, and that he hoped that if he ever came to England, he would come there and speak at the association. This door is open ajar, Mr. Moody exclaimed, but we will consider the letter as God's hand leading to York, and we will go there. After spending one night in Liverpool, Mr. Moody, with his family, took the train for London, and Mr. Sankey went to Manchester, to the home of the one man whom he knew in England, Henry Morehouse. On receiving Mr. Moody's dispatch that he was ready to begin his meetings in York, Mr. Bennett replied that everything was so cold and dead in the town that it would take at least a month to prepare for the intended mission. The dispatch concluded by asking Mr. Moody to name a date, when he could consult him regarding the proposed meetings. With his usual promptness, this telegram was sent to reply. I will be in New York tonight. At ten o'clock that evening he reached the city, where no one except his friend Mr. Bennett had ever seen him, and very few had ever heard his name. The situation was not encouraging, but after looking it over carefully, Mr. Moody declared that every man must make his own way, and that he was ready to go in at once. Mr. Sankey was telegraphed for, and the meetings opened immediately. The next morning application was made to several ministers of the town for the use of their pulpits in the coming Sabbath and two Wesleyan, a Baptist, and a Congregational Church were placed at their disposal. It is interesting to look at the files of the religious papers for the two years that covered Mr. Moody's campaign in Great Britain. In some of the later issues, double numbers were published, the extra pages being devoted entirely to articles concerning the Great Meetings. In contrast with these extensive reports is the following modest little notice in one corner of the Christian, entitled, Mr. D. L. Moody in England. Mr. Moody has arrived in England with his family and is accompanied by a Christian brother, who leads the singing at his meetings, after the manner of our well-known and much-loved friend Philip Phillips. Mrs. Moody and her children remain with their sister in the neighborhood of London, while her husband is holding meetings in the provinces. Last Lord's Day he preached in independent and Wesleyan chapels in York, and we believe that he intends to continue while in the north of England, and then go to Scotland. He prefers preaching in chapels, and so strengthening existing causes, to commencing a new work in public halls, etc., any friends who desire his help, especially in the North, should write him at once. Young Men's Christian Association, York. We will notify a change of address from week to week as we receive it from him. The clergy at first were strongly inclined to look upon the newcomers with suspicion and disfavor, and the attendance was small to begin with. But gradually the meetings grew in interest. The clergy cooperated, and both preaching and singing became the subject of public conversation throughout the community. Mr. Moody wrote from York on June 30th to Mr. Farwell of Chicago as follows. You will see by the heading of this note that I am in York. I began here one week ago yesterday, Sunday, and have had splendid success so far. Yesterday we had four meetings. They were large, and I think very profitable. God was with me. I preached in the morning on They That Be Wise Shall Shine, in the afternoon on No Difference, and in the evening from the text, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Sankey sang the hymns finely. All seem to be much pleased with him. I think he's going to do much good here. All chapels are open to us, and invitations are coming from all over the country. I think we shall have all we can do here. I think of you all and get fearfully homesick at times. 
Keep me posted in regard to the Young Men's Christian Association building and all about the stock. I should like to see a good building go up there. I do not see any better opportunity to work for Christ than in that field. I do not know what is to become the Young Men's Christian Association in England and America if something of the kind is not done. I send you some flower seeds. I think the one marked I-6 is beautiful and never have seen anything in America like it. I hope you will have success with them. Remember me to Wells and all your family. Yours to the grace of God. Yes, I have known Mr. Moody ever since a memorable Monday morning in 1873, writes the Reverend Effie Mayer, who was among the first to associate himself with the movement. I can see him now, standing up to lead the first noon prayer meeting in a small, ill-lit room in Coney Street, York. Little realizing that it was the seed germ of a mighty harvest, and that a movement was beginning that would culminate in a few months in Free Assembly Hall, Edinburgh, and ultimately in the Agricultural Hall in the Royal Opera House, London. It was the birth time of new conceptions of ministry, new methods of work, new inspirations, and hope. What an inspiration when this great and noble soul first broke into my life. I was a young pastor then, in the old city of York, and bound rather rigidly by the chains of conventionalism. Such had been my training, and such might have been my career. But here was a revelation of a new kind. The first characteristic of Mr. Moody's that struck me was that he was so absolutely unconventional and natural, that a piece of work had generally been done after a certain method would probably be the reason why he would set about it in some fresh and unexpected way. That the new method startled people was the greatest reason for continuing with it, if only it drew them to the gospel. But there was never the slightest approach to irreverence, fanaticism, or extravagance. Everything was in perfect accord with a rare common sense, a directness of method, a simplicity, a transparency of aim, which were as attractive as they were fruitful in result. The first ten days of his meetings were only modestly successful, and he gladly accepted my invitation to come to the chapel where I ministered, and there we had a fortnight of most blessed and memorable meetings. The little vestry here, how vividly I remember it, was the scene of our long and earnest prayers as we knelt around the leather-covered table in the middle of the room. Two Presbyterian students, brothers, from Dr. McKay's church in Hull, often used to pray with us. And I remember that Mr. Moody, at the Great Free Trade Hall, Manchester, referred to that little room as the fountain from which the river of blessing for the whole country had sprung. Many recollections of those days come back as I write. How in the midst of tea at home, Mr. Moody suddenly felt that he should preach his afterward famous sermon on heaven, and started off on a three miles walk to fetch his notes. How Mr. Sankey went over to see Mr. Rees of Sunderland, the sailor preacher to whom I had introduced them, and proved his singing power in the little back parlor of a butcher's shop, to the entire satisfaction of both minister and elder. How we had our all-day meeting, the first of its kind in England, and how the fire of God burned hot in all our hearts. Ah, blessed days, that will live as long as memory endures, days of heaven, of wonder, of a new and brilliant constellation in one sphere and of the beginning of a lifelong devotion to another man, which has only ripened and deepened with every succeeding year. The first public report of the meetings in York appeared in The Christian for July 10th, in a letter from Mr. Bennett, who said, The following notes of our brother D. L. Moody's evangelistic labors in this city will doubtless be welcomed by your readers. On Sunday morning, June 22nd, Mr. Moody preached in Salem Congregational Chapel to Christian workers, in the afternoon in the Corn Exchange to about a thousand persons, and in the evening in Wesley Chapel. Many were impressed. Every evening during the following week, Bible lectures were delivered in various chapels. Each service resulted in the saving of souls, but especially in the quickening of believers. Formality and apathy were to a great extent dissipated. And Christians have been led to pray and work for the conversion of souls. During the past week, the Lord has greatly blessed us in the ingathering of souls. On Sabbath day, June 29th, Mr. Moody preached in two other chapels, and also twice in the Corn Exchange, to audiences numbering about a thousand each. Every week evening service is preceded by a service of song, conducted by Mr. Moody's co-laborer, Mr. Sankey, whose hymns, tunes, and voice, like those of Philip Phillips, have drawn and impressed many. Mr. Moody preaches the gospel, and Mr. Sankey sings it. Prayer meetings have been held every noon at the rooms of the Young Men's Christian Association, and many there have offered themselves and others for the prayers of God's people. Though this is the summer season, and we are under a disadvantage in consequence, through the miscarriage of letters to and from Mr. Moody, of not having notice, and therefore were unprepared for his visit, when Mr. Moody dropped down on us on the Saturday afternoon, arrangements were made and bills printed, all in a few hours, 
and from the first the Lord has greatly blessed our brother's labors in the strengthening and stimulating of Christians, and in the bringing of many out of darkness into light. This visit will long be remembered in the city. The congregations have from the first been increasingly large. All denominations have opened their chapels and given us their presence and help. Many at the clergy have also heartily bidden them Godspeed. P.S. Sunday evening, 11 p.m. Just before posting this, let me add that this afternoon a large chapel was filled to hear Mr. Moody. A deep impression was made. I was just come from the evening service, where every aisle and standing place, the vestries and lobbies, even the pulpit stairs, were crowded nearly half an hour before the evening service commenced. The Holy Spirit worked mightily. Sinners in all positions of life sought the Lord earnestly. The Christian brothers and sisters of the Church of England, friends and of every denomination, were constrained without invitation to speak and pray with them. I don't know how many, but over fifty gave their hearts to Christ. Mr. Moody will, if the Lord will, proceed to Scarborough tomorrow. Writing again from York, July 18th, Mr. Bennett said that the American evangelists were still there, and that every meeting during the week just past had been attended with great blessing. One distinguishing feature of his brother's meetings, he said, is the Bible lectures which he gives on such subjects as the blood of Christ, walking with God, etc. The passages of Scripture are previously selected and read out by friends in various parts of the audience. The chapel was crowded long before the service last evening, and many sought and found the Savior. We have had most refreshing seasons in our afternoon prayer meetings. We hope to continue them. Let me ask the Lord's children to pray that these meetings may become an institution in this city, and be greatly used of God in the binding together of Christians of every name, in the deepening of their spiritual life and fervor, and in the establishment of a great rallying center for organization and aggressive effort. Each public service was followed by an inquiry meeting which at first was considered a novelty, but generally became a great power in the work. Mr. Moody's manner of expounding the scriptures at once attracted attention. The Bible readings which he had given in Brooklyn and other cities were continued with great effect. Believers were aroused to a new interest in the sacred word. Bibles were seen at every meeting, and new methods of Bible study were suggested. Mr. Mayers thinks that no one has given a greater impulse to Bible study than Mr. Moody. During the time of his meetings in Great Britain, for Baxter Publishing House could hardly keep pace with the demand for Bibles, which he created, he said. He knew his Bible as very few have done, and was always wearing out Bibles, covering the margins with references and notes, and allowing them to pass freely among his friends. His Bible school and the Chicago Seminary have filled hundreds of young minds with the same enthusiasm. In my earliest acquaintance with him, I remember how eager he was that I should tell him any new thing I had discovered in the Word of God. How interested he was, for instance, when I said that the use of the articles in Acts 1 indicated that the scene of Pentecost was the same upper room where the apostles had prepared the Passover. The first all-day meeting which Mr. Moody held in England was arranged with Mr. Mayer and himself as they walked up and down Coney Street, York. It began at 11 a.m. and lasted six hours, and an evening service followed. From its novelty it attracted great attention, and it commanded itself heartily to all who attended the services. First, there was an hour for confession and prayer. Second, an hour for praise. Third, a promise meeting, which consisted of testimonies on the part of believers to the fulfillment of promises in their own experiences. Fourth, a witness meeting, which was a succession of public confessions of Christ by young converts. Fifth, a Bible lecture by Mr. Moody. And finally, communion service conducted by Mr. Moody and four ministers. After five weeks of meeting in York, resulting in the professed confession of several hundred people, Mr. Moody went to Sunderland. Here the meetings were even more largely attended. The chapel in which the services were held soon became too small for the audience, finally necessitating the use of one of the largest halls in the north of England. Mr. Rees, who invited Mr. Moody to Sunderland, was an open communion Baptist, the pastor of the Bethesda Chapel, where the inquiry meetings were held after the first meeting in the Victoria Hall. The weekday meetings were held in such chapels as could be secured, for there was more or less criticism to be overcome. It was said that there was only one minister heartily in sympathy with the revival movement. All the other clergymen were half-hearted or even active in opposition. During the Sunderland mission, a committee from the Young Men's Christian Association called upon Mr. Moody and asked him to speak before the young men. The invitation was readily accepted. The committee then apologized for not joining earlier in the work, explaining that their delay was not due to lack of sympathy, but to the fear that the association would be injured if its officers seemed to favor a sectarian work. When they came to a better acquaintance with him, they were frank to acknowledge how little they knew at the time of the spirit of the preacher. In Sunderland, as in York, special stress was laid upon the noon prayer meeting and upon the afternoon meetings. Here also an all-day meeting was held. 
It is interesting to read the impression which Mr. Rees had after working for a month with Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey. One, both these brethren are genuine to the backbone. Two, they are as disinterested as they are zealous, and their zeal is extraordinary. Three, Mr. Moody is the Mercurius of the pair. Mr. Sankey is not the Jupiter, but the Orpheus. The former is not eloquent, but very fluent, not poetical or rhetorical, but he never talks twaddle, and seldom utters a sentence that is not well worth hearing. He is a rapid, too rapid a speaker. Nevertheless, what he does say is sensible, forcible, and to the point, and not too long, which is a great advantage. He is American to the core, in speech, intonation, and vigor. His antidotes are superabundant, and for the most part, the acquisition of his own experiences. They are always apt, often most pathetic, and sometimes appealing. His earnestness is intense, his energy untiring, his courage large, his tact uncommon, and his love for souls most tender. After the Sunderland mission, Mr. Moody began a new work in Newcastle on the Tyne. He had now gained the sympathy of nearly all the ministers of the several denominations, except those of the established church, who, learning that he was not ordained, refused in any way to countenance the work. After a few weeks of very successful meetings, the editor of the Newcastle Chronicle, Mr. Cohen, then a member of Parliament for that district, described the meeting in his paper, speaking of them as a wonderful religious phenomenon. On the whole, it was a friendly review and criticism of the work. This was an unusual notice for such a prominent secular paper, and Mr. Cohen's article created a profound impression throughout England, resulting in invitations to hold services in other cities. Mr. Moody had been slowly overcoming the prejudice against his preaching, and Mr. Sankey's singing at York and Sunderland. But when he accepted an invitation to visit Newcastle, the home of the Mr. Bainbridge, at whose invitation partly he was in England, he did so with the determination to stay there long enough to settle for all time the questions which had arisen as to their methods and motives. He knew that he could accomplish nothing among the people until he had their confidence, and this would be won most easily when he had the cooperation of the clergymen. On this line and in this place, if it takes all summer, was his spirit, if not his motto. The meetings were held in the Rye Hill Baptist Chapel, seating some 1,600 people, and while they were not large at first, they increased rapidly. Mr. Moody Preachers wrote a friendly critic at the time, but the conventional use of the word preaching does not convey any notion of Mr. Moody's talk. He is a businessman, and he means business. Every word he speaks is meant to lead to a definite business. If it does not do that, he regards it thrown away. Most people believe that there is a life beyond the grave, and that there is some way of salvation and some way of being lost forever. And this is rather important business after all. Mr. Moody goes into the heart of this matter at once, and he puts it in a business way. He says he himself has salvation, in fact is saved forever by the Son of God, and that every soul that wants it may have it too, at once, and know it, and go home with it, and be as happy as he likes. A good many, if not all, of the early earnest ministers of all denominations endorse as perfectly true what he says, though it is put in a new way. But better than all, he takes his stand by the Bible and proves it. I think this ought to be more widely known. Here at Newcastle, the same increasing interest that had been experienced at Sunderland attended the mission. The meetings were transferred from a church to the music hall, and there Mr. Moody and his friend, Henry Morehouse, who had joined him, preached to the great congregations which gathered there. Educated people were among the first converts. Those who had known the scriptures from childhood decided definite for a religious life, and the work thus started went down through all classes of society and influenced the surrounding towns. The inquiry room work was thorough every inquirer being known by name and residence. As rapidly as possible, ministers and experienced Christian workers only were allowed to have a hand in this important part of the meetings, and they were admitted by ticket. When an all-day meeting was announced to be held at Newcastle on November 12th, many anticipated failure. But those who had felt the reviving power and the love of God, and had made this meeting a matter of earnest prayer, knew that it could not fail. Not only did the people from Newcastle attend in large numbers, but people from Sunderland, Shields, Jarrow, and neighboring towns came in by train and filled the church and galleries. Businesses, home cares, and works, pleasure and idleness had been left behind by the hundreds of earnest Christians who came to worship God and to hear His word. An hour was given to prayer and Bible reading, and a second hour to promises, Mr. Moody leading during this part of the service. Another hour was set apart for experiences and exhortation, which was followed by an address by Mr. Morehouse on separation. The sixth and last hour was devoted to a sermon on heaven preached by Mr. Moody. In the evening, a gospel service was held, Moody and Morehouse speaking. The chapel was filled to overflowing. After this all-day meeting, the work seemed to grow steadily. 
Mr. Morehouse speaks in this connection of four things which he had observed about Adir Moody's work, as he called it. 1. He believes firmly that the gospel saves sinners when they believe, and he rests on the simple story of a crucified and risen Savior. 2. He expects, when he goes to preach, that souls will be saved, and the result is that God honors his faith. 3. He preaches as if there never was to be another meeting, and as if sinners might never hear the gospel sound again. These appeals to decide now are most impressive. 4. He gets Christians to work in the after meetings. He urges them to ask those who are sitting near them if they are saved. Everything about this work is very simple, and I would advise the workers in the Lord's vineyard to see and hear our beloved brothers, and if possible learn some blessed lessons from them in soul winning. At one of the inquiry meetings at Newcastle, Mr. Moody had an interview, which he often related in later years, as illustrating the need of confession and restitution. The inquirer complained that every time she began to pray, five bottles of wine came up before her mind, which she had stolen when serving as housekeeper for a gentleman. She had never been able to pray since. In replying to a reply for advice, Mr. Moody said without hesitating, Pay for them. But the person is dead, she said. Are not some of the heirs living? Yes, a son. Then go to that son and pay him back. I want to see the face of God, she said. But I could not think of doing a thing like that. My reputation is at stake. She went away and came back the next day to ask if it would not do just as well to put the money in the treasury of the Lord. No, was the reply. God doesn't want any stolen money. The only thing is to make restitution. For several days she struggled with her pride, but finally went into the country, saw the son of her former employer, made a confession, and offered him a five-pound note. He said he didn't want the money, but she finally persuaded him to take it, and came back at peace with God and the world. The Life of D.L. Moody Chapter 17 Birth of the Moody and Sankey Hymn Book Newcastle was the birthplace of the Moody and Sankey Hymn Book, for it was during this mission that the demand for its publication first became urgent. The hymns and tunes used in the British churches and chapels were not adapted to evangelistic services, and neither Mr. Moody nor Mr. Sankey were familiar with the books in use. They therefore adopted for use in their meetings Philip Phillips' book, Hallowed Songs, containing many American hymns and a few English tunes. Mr. Sankey used such hymns from his private collection as he had been singing in Chicago and elsewhere, and which were not contained in this book. Some of these became very popular, and in a short time frequent requests were made for the publication. With the view of meeting the many inquiries as to where the hymns could be procured, Mr. Sankey wrote to the publishers of the book they had adopted, offering to supply a dozen or more of the songs he was singing, provided they would print them in the back of their own book. This offer was not accepted, and when urged again later, it was definitely declined. As the request for the publication of the hymns continued, Mr. Moody determined to publish the hymns on his own responsibility, and agreed with Mr. Morgan and Scott to issue a pamphlet of 16 pages, personally guaranteeing the cost of the plates. This collection of songs was known as the Sacred Songs and Solos, and sold in large quantities at sixpence a copy. For several months it was used in the service as a solo book, in connection with the larger book originally adopted. From time to time, editions of new songs were made to the smaller collection, and several months later a small book, of words only, was published and sold for one penny, two cents per copy, after which the larger hymn book first adopted was discontinued. Mr. Moody's faith in the power of sacred song was fully rewarded, for he lived to see these songs make their way into the hearts of millions of people, and afford the means of establishing and maintaining churches, Christian associations, educational institutions, and biblical schools. The first advertisement of Sacred Songs and Solos appeared in The Christian of September 18, 1873, which gave it a much wider circulation than would have been possible through its use in the meetings alone, and it soon found its way into all parts of the British Empire, and later on into every Christian land. The copyright of the book was not taken out by Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey, but by the publishers. On reaching Ireland, it was rumored that Mr. Moody was growing rich by the royalties from the hymn books. This he publicly denied, together with other reports of a like character to the effect that P.T. Barnum, the greatest showman, was behind the whole movement. On the occasion of the visit to London, preparatory to the great meetings held there, Mr. Moody stated in a large public meeting of ministers and others that the royalties from the hymn book would then in the hands of the publishers, together with what might afterward accrue, would be placed in the hands of a committee of well-known businessmen, of which Mr. Hugh M. Matheson of London was chairman, which committee would disperse the royalties as they saw fit. At the close of the London campaign, and shortly before Moody and Sankey returned to America, 
The statement of Morgan and Scott, publishers of the hymn book, show that the sum standing to the credit of the evangelist was now £7,000, or $35,000. Word was sent to the committee that this amount was at their disposal, to be used as they might elect. The committee refused to dispose of the funds for general purposes, asserting that they did not propose to have Mr. Moody pay this large sum for the privilege of preaching in London. Mr. Moody's church in Chicago had been partially rebuilt after the fire, for owing to the panic which followed in 1873-74, a good portion of the pledges made for its erection had grown worthless, and the work stopped with the completion of the first story only. A temporary roof had been placed over this, however, and services had been held there while Mr. Moody was abroad. A friend from Chicago, who was interested in the church, was in London at this time, and hearing that there was no one who would take the hymn book money, he suggested to the committee that it be forwarded to Chicago to complete that building. This suggestion was adopted, the money paid over, and the splendid edifice at Chicago Avenue and La Salle Street, which has been a center of spiritual activity for more than 25 years, was completed and dedicated free of debt. While Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey were abroad, P.P. Bliss, who was then associated with Major D.W. Whittle in the evangelistic work, brought out for use in their meetings a small volume of hymns and tunes under the title of Gospel Songs, mostly of Mr. Bliss's composition. When Mr. Moody returned to America in August 1875, it became necessary to arrange for the publication of a new collection of hymns, composed largely of those which had been in use abroad. It was decided to unite in making the book, and after much discussion as to a name, the title Gospel Hymns and Sacred Songs was adopted. The first book became very popular, and a large number were sold during the great meetings held in Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, and Boston. Since Mr. Bliss, Mr. Sankey, Mr. McGranahan, Mr. Stebbins, and others continued writing new songs and tunes as Mr. Moody's work went on, it was natural that there should be subsequent compilations, and Gospel Hymns number 1 was followed by numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The royalties from these books were at first paid over to a committee of prominent businessmen of Philadelphia, Chicago, and New York, of which William E. Dodge, of the last name City, was chairman, and were distributed by them for the benefits of religious, philanthropic, and educational purposes in many parts of the United States. At Northfield, East Hall, a dormitory of the Young Ladies' Seminary, and Stone Hall, a recitation hall of the same institution, together with the recitation hall at Mount Hernan, were erected from this fund. At the present time, all royalties were paid directly to the trustees of the schools of Northfield and Mount Hernan. The following statement from Mr. Dodge, chairman of the American Trustees, is of special interest in this connection. Mr. Moody was greatly pained when in Great Britain to find that those who were opposed to the new religious life had circulated reports that large sums of money were made from the royalties on the hymn book, and that the meetings were really carried out for the purpose of selling it, thus increasing the income of those conducting them. On his return to America, and before visiting the great cities of the country, he felt the need of a book of hymns and tunes adopted to his use here, and determined to arrange its publication so as to avoid all possible criticism. He invited me to visit Northfield to confer with him on the subject, which he felt to be of great importance. I met there Mr. Sankey and Mr. Bliss, and felt a most delightful and unusual spirit of Christian self-sacrifice on their parts. They were willing to contribute their own hymns and tunes and the copyrights which they held, and joined with Mr. Moody in giving up all possible claim to any benefits which might arise from their publication. Mr. Moody urged me to act as trustee, to arrange with the publishers for a royalty, and to receive any money which might come from this source, and distribute it at my discretion for religious and benevolent purposes. I declined to act alone, but promised Mr. Moody that if two other gentlemen were selected, I would gladly serve with them and suggested the names of George H. Stewart of Philadelphia and John V. Farwell of Chicago. A board of trustees was thus formed. The sale of the first editions of the book greatly exceeded our expectation, and although the royalties were, on a single copy, small, as trustees we received by September 1885 the large sum of $357,388.64. All of this was carefully distributed among various religious and educational institutions. It was finally determined to be wise and right that, as the schools in Northfield had become so firmly established and were doing such great work, the entire royalties of these books should be turned over to the trustees of these schools, and this was accordingly done under careful legal advice. During all these years, neither Mr. Moody nor Mr. Sankey had any fixed income. Mr. Sankey especially had given up copyrights that would have brought him a large sum yearly and opportunities to hold musical institutions and conventions, which would have added largely to his income. Neither of them during the whole continuance of the trust received one dollar of personal advantage, 
and as they had no definite means of support, the self-sacrifice and the unselfishness of this course, in order to prevent the slightest breath of scandal and not weaken the influence of their personal work, were very remarkable and very beautiful. I have never known anything like it. In closing the trust, which was a peculiar one, after getting full legal advice, I submitted the opinions to a lawyer of very high national reputation, the leader of the bar in New York in all matters of consultation. He was greatly interested in the form of the trust, though he had but little sympathy with the religious work. He gave a large amount of time and thought to the matter, and after giving his opinion, I asked him to be kind enough to send me a memorandum, so that I could personally send him a check, which I suppose would necessarily be a large one. He told me that under no possible circumstances would he accept dissent, that the unselfishness and splendid quality of men who could make such a sacrifice was a revelation of human nature that made him feel better disposed towards mankind. I have ventured to go into the matter somewhat at length, because while Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey have not received dissent to the personal benefit from the royalties of the hymn books, unkind and ignorant assertions have been made to the contrary in some quarters. In the later editions of Gospel Songs, the services of George C. Stubbins and James McGrennan should receive special mention. Both these gentlemen were closely associated with Mr. Moody in his evangelistic work in Great Britain and America, and were prominent in the Northfield Conventions and Bible Schools. My acquaintance with Mr. Moody began in 1871, writes Mr. Stebbins. I used to see him in the noon meetings in Chicago, where I occasionally went to help in the singing. But it was not till the summer of 1876 that I came more directly in touch with him. In August of that year, at the request of Major Whittle, whom I met in Boston, I went up to Northfield to spend a Sunday with him and Mr. Moody, to assist them in some services that had been arranged for that day. This was the first time I had seen Mr. Moody since the night he left Chicago for his work in Great Britain which was destined so soon to make him known throughout the Christian world. And yet, though he was then at the height of his fame, and conceded to be one of the great religious characters of his time, he was still the same unassuming, unaffected man that he was before his work had brought him into such prominence before the world. He was spending the summer at his home for rest, as he had just concluded his great campaigns in Brooklyn, New York, and Philadelphia. But even then, he could not be kept still. He was preaching two or three times every Sunday, in some of the smaller towns or cities among the New England hills, and during his days at home he was always trying to interest the neighbors and the country people in something besides their daily round of toil, always having their spiritual welfare at heart. I remember very well an instance of this. During the few days that I was visiting him he drove about the country and invited the people to his house to hear some music. The day set was very hot and sultry, but the people crowded the rooms to suffocation, and he, taking a place by an open window, in full view of the audience and the performer, gave directions as to what should be sung, occasionally making some encouraging or humorous remark to keep up the interest. Anyone with such a keen sense of humor as his must have been amused to see the singer sweltering in the heat while doing his best for an hour or more to entertain the guest. During that visit, Mr. Moody induced me to enter evangelistic work, and my connection with him and Mr. Sankey dates from that time. My first work was to organize and drill the choir of 800 singers for his great tabernacle work in Chicago, which began in October of that year and continued till the end of December. During the years that have followed, it has been the privilege of Mrs. Stebbins and myself to be associated with Mr. Moody in several of his great campaigns, both at home and abroad, all of which have been memorable as indicating the extraordinary hold he had on the affections of the people of all classes. Mr. Moody not only loved nature, but art and poetry also, and the latter more especially as it was found in the poetical books of the Bible. He would sometimes ask for a chapter, and after listening intently to its close, he would break the spell by saying, Beautiful then drop on his knees and pour out his heart to God in thanksgiving and prayer. His thoughtfulness for others, especially for those working with him, was very marked. It was not uncommon for him, at the close of a hard day's work, to say, just before he began his last address, You slip out and go home. I'll get on. I want you to be fresh for tomorrow. In this connection I might speak of another trait of his that may not be generally known. That is, his disposition to make others as little trouble as possible on his account. I have known him to put up with annoying things, and positively suffer discomforts rather than inconvenience others or indulge in fault-finding. Some interesting illustrations of his conscientiousness in regard to accepting compensations for his services in evangelistic work came under my notice while spending a winter with him in the West. We had held a mission in one of the large cities for five weeks, having three meetings a day. At the close, a representative of the finance committee came to his hotel and handed him a check for $1,500 for himself and his assistant. He immediately handed it back, saying that it was too much. A day or so afterward, the gentleman went again to the hotel, and not seeing Mr. Moody, left the same check for him. Finding it awaiting him on his return, he took it back to the gentleman, who, in telling me about it afterwards, stated that Mr. Moody told him in very plain terms that he meant what he said when he first returned the check, and he would not accept it. A thousand dollars was afterwards given him, 
This he accepted. This decision was in consideration of the fact that he had then well underway plans for establishing the Bible Institute in Chicago, and also that he needed money all the time to carry on his schools at Northfield. Immediately after this, a 10-day series of meetings were began in a city close by, at the close of which the committee handed him $500, which he accepted. But at the last meeting, when a collection was taken up to pay off the debt of the Young Men's Christian Association, he contributed the whole amount that had been given him for his services. The last time we heard Mr. Moody preach was at the church in Northfield in September 1899, the first Sabbath after the opening of the seminary. There were no flowers at the church, and he remarked upon it, saying that he wished the senior class of the seminary to act as a committee to see that there were flowers every Sunday. He then said, I preached in Plymouth Church, Brooklyn last Sunday, and there was no flowers. One of the papers said the next day that the usual flowers were omitted from the pulpit because it was understood Mr. Moody did not like flowers. Turning to me, he said, Stebbins, you tell them when you go back to Brooklyn how I love flowers. Mr. and Mrs. McGranahan were associated in evangelistic worth with Major Whittle, but frequently assisted Mr. Moody in his conventions, at his meetings, and at his schools, and were often in his home. No one could know him without loving him, said Mr. Granahan, nor be with him without being benefited. Once in a western city some twenty years ago, a number of people had gathered in his room and were discussing some knotty question with a good deal of warmth and earnestness. Conflicting opinions were freely and emphatically expressed. Mr. Moody looked on, a silent spectator. When all had gone, I should never forget which remark nor the spirit it revealed. Mac, the world is in great need of peacemakers. I trust I may never lose the desire then felt to be among that number. Untiring in his own labors, his consideration for others was as tender as a father's. When we were holding a series of meetings at Auburn, New York, Mr. Moody came during the closing week to get a convention. I found it difficult to continue to lead the singing and do the solo work that was expected. But, as I have often done before, I decided to stand by the choir until I could do no more. Mr. Moody said, No, it is not required of you to attempt what you are not able to do. Your voice is of too much importance to injure it knowingly. We do not serve a hard master. When health is at stake, matters beyond our control interfere, our duty is plain. Go at once and leave the convention with the Major and me. Care for your voice, and have it for use as long as you live. Mr. Moody has always been an inspiration to me in preparing hymns for gospel work. Not that he was a musician or claimed to be, but I soon learned to prize his judgment as to the value and usefulness of a hymn for our work. What moved him was sure to move others, and what failed to do so could safely be omitted. I have esteemed it one of my highest privileges to share in preparing songs for his work, and now that he is gone, how lonely it seems. To learn more about God's Peculiar People, visit the links in the description.